We fish for compliments and value falsely honeyed words over the harsh truth and corrections. We feel our inflated ego is bruised when we are berated and criticized in a personal or a workspace. Some of us are hypersensitive to criticism. This makes us feel attacked by the sword of others' opinions, with which either we get hurt or we dodge it completely. Let's face it, people talk a lot, and sometimes it's in our favor, but mostly not. Even if you've made it big in your life, you will be talked about in a negative light. And oh, if you're not successful, then you're going to be roasted alive, which will obviously be behind your back. So for as long as you live, you have to listen to what other people have to say about you. Actually, even after you're dead, you're not really spared, and that's just the way it is. So, since this is an inevitable part of our lives, we should be able to respond to criticism positively and with nobility. This film is about how to deal with criticism, both constructive and destructive, and learning a life skill on how to give constructive criticism. People judge and criticize you exactly as you are right now. Maybe they're judging how you look or what you're choosing to do or not do with your life, what you're eating or not eating, what you're wearing, what you're listening to. And heck, if you tell the truth, you judge and criticize yourself constantly. This is normal and it's part of being human. Types of Criticisms there are two types of criticism, namely constructive and destructive criticism, which are different in the ways in which the comments are delivered, the tone in which they are conveyed, and the people who deliver them. There's always an appropriate way of saying something. The tone of destructive criticism can be negative, mean, and angry. It can also make you feel as though the person is just pointing out everything that's wrong with you, as though they're just blaming you. Hear it enough and experience it with plenty of intensity, and it might even feel as though you're being bullied. Destructive criticism is the hate that's spewed by the poisoned tongues of those who dislike you. They pass on verdicts about your character or behavior targeted to bring you down. Even though we intellectually know that the people who make these scathing remarks are the ones who need help, we emotionally get subjugated to their bullying. Even a person with a really high self-confidence can find themselves negatively impacted if they're constantly barraged by somebody else's emotional abuse. The person who's constantly doing all the criticizing might tell you that they're saying what they're saying for the sake of helping you, when in reality, they're going about it in the wrong way. Studies show that those who received destructive criticism reported greater anger and tension and indicated that they would be more likely to handle future disagreements with the source through resistance or avoidance and less likely to do it through collaboration or compromise. Hence, if criticism is taken word by word, it can leave you feeling dejected and is discouraging. It's said that people who avoid all criticism fail. It's destructive criticism we need to avoid, not criticism in all forms. Constructive criticism is not a series of blatant judgments. It comprises of thoughtful feedbacks which can help you gain valuable insights about how you're perceived as which is presented to you after careful scrutiny by those who care about you. Constructive criticism is a blessing in disguise which can aid in our further improvements. Constructive criticism is just feedback without the imposing tone. It's somebody saying something like, hey, maybe you should try blank instead of doing blank because I think that would really work for you. Notice that in my example, there's no negative tone or imposing attitude. As beneficial as constructive criticism is, in most cases, whether in professional or personal life, most of us don't always receive it sincerely or get feedback of any kind because, let's face it, everyone is busy building their own nests. Hence, we get destructive criticism. The difficult part about dealing with it is that it can damage your ego, self-esteem, and self-confidence. Usually, the intention of hurtful critics while criticizing others is to somehow feel better about themselves by pushing the other person down and have no other justification for it. They feel that they can shine better if they blow out your light or lower its radiance. Unlike constructive criticism that is intended for the purpose of helping you improve some part of your life, 
destructive criticism might hide other intentions, such as a desire to manipulate, feelings of envy, the desire to be hurtful consciously or subconsciously, or a person not being happy with their own performance in life, so they project their unhappiness on you by nitpicking. Sometimes the person constantly criticizing you does it because it's a bad habit that they have. It's something that comes practically instinctive to them. For all you know, maybe they had a highly critical parent. They're so used to that kind of behavior that now they themselves are pros at doing it. False criticism is insignificant, so you don't need to take it on its face value. The majority of the time, the people who are the harshest critics are creative cowards. They are bystanders on the sidelines of life who risk nothing and create nothing. If you remain silent and detach yourself from the string of words attempted to sting you, you refuse to give it more importance than it deserves. It's better to not give it power over yourself. Most criticism is not constructive. It's just someone's opinion. For example, let's say your friend hates chocolate. Does that mean chocolate sucks? No. In fact, I'm not a huge fan of chocolate, especially dark chocolate. Does that mean I'm hurting dark chocolate's feelings? No, I'm not. The point is, my opinion makes it no less valid or delicious except to me. Criticism represents just one person's point of view, and you cannot expect other people to understand the intricacies of your own mind. When someone criticizes you, what they're doing is expressing their opinion, not fact. If you take it as fact, then you might be more likely to be defensive. So let's start out by just reframing that in a way that allows us to see it less personally and realize that it is simply an opinion. Everybody has one. And we don't have to respond to that as if it's a, an attack. Criticism is just another form of people's opinions. And opinions are like a certain part of the human anatomy. Everyone has one and most of them stink. So, it is best to keep your feelings under wraps, no matter how provocative the remarks may get, as it may give the attacker the consolation and satisfaction of having successfully troubled you and make them feel like a soldier returning after winning a battle. So, when we're on the receiving end of criticism, our goal should be to filter the dirt, learn from the feedback, and not let emotions cloud our minds. The key is to be proactive and not reactive. In fact, negative reaction to criticism often convinces the person doing the criticizing that they are accurate in their assessment of you. Just remember, often you will be criticized by someone who is doing less than you, and seldom criticized by people who are doing more than you. Most of the time when criticism comes, it's because you're here with your friends right now, okay? You're on this level. And then what happens is is that you are now starting to step up. Your friends say, this is crazy. This is ridiculous. Why are you doing this? You're going to fail. You're going to fail. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. And you start to go up, and then all of a sudden you actually start to succeed. And now they look up to you but they don't like to look up at you. They want to look at the same level as you. But to get to where you are here, from here, took you a year to do, or two years. And yet, you're not coming back down. And so now these people often feel resentful and critical of you, right? You've experienced this, I'm sure you have. Critics only criticize people who are playing at excellence. They don't go for mediocre people. So almost see criticism as a compliment. I mean, in some cultures, they call it the tall poppy syndrome, that when the poppy goes above the other poppies, some people start to chop it down so that you're the same size as everyone else. So just remember that when you're criticized, it's a, it's a reflection that you're actually playing at excellence. It's almost a compliment. First of all, listen to criticism, rather than lending your deaf ears to it. You can always ignore it, if the criticism does not matter to your growth. Every form of criticism is a feedback from people who like you or dislike you. People who genuinely support you express their expectation of you through their criticism. You need to pay attention to the underlying messages in their criticism and identify areas where improvements can be made. Interpreting someone else's feedback is an opportunity for rational thinking sometimes. Despite a negative tone, criticism is incredibly useful. When someone criticizes you, reframe that negative 
uh, situation as an opportunity. And ask yourself, what can I learn from this criticism? Is there any valid information that I could use to play even better, to be even better, to think even better? So use criticism for your advantage. Criticism opens you up to new perspectives and ideas that you may not have considered otherwise. If you are getting constructive criticism, you can agree briefly with your critic, depending on what happened. Don't need to keep defending yourself with endless explanations and excuses. Defensiveness validates accusation. If someone's accusing you of something and you become all defensive, it validates the accusation. It tells them, oh yeah, you're onto something here. You've hit a soft spot here. You've got me, right? Even if you're not guilty, the defensiveness tends to give that feeling that you're guilty because you're trying to cover it up. You can listen objectively, take what makes sense to you, and ignore what you render useless. Some of the biggest growth I can tell you that we can experience in life comes from listening to the views of others. And then, this is the important part, filtering it through our own mind and our own hearts to determine is that valid. Because if you can listen to what somebody says and then go, you know, I can see where, yeah, I, I do that. Like if I cut somebody off in the middle of a sentence and it's a habitual problem, then that's not really a good thing to do. It's not good communication skills. So it's something, thank you for bringing that to my attention. I'll work on it. If we don't hear people out and hear what they have to say and they bring that to our attention, then that's a good thing as well. So if, if people are giving us information out of love, we can take it. And again, ultimately, the most important thing, though, is that we filter it ourselves, consider it, let down our defenses, because defense is just fear, let down our fears and examine it. And then if we see it's valid, then we can improve from that. And we can be grateful to them and say, I love you. Thank you for doing that for me. The important part here is to let go of your ego that has a habit of shutting down when people speak unpleasant things about you. So, the focus is not on winning an argument, but validating behavioral corrections. An incredibly useful exercise is to agree with criticism directed towards you. The simple act of agreeing with criticism diffuses the situation, satisfies a person's need to express a point of view, offers you a chance to get a feedback, and provides an opportunity to remain calm. When McDonald's trains its recruits, they're told, that the complaints they're going to hear from the customers are directed at their aprons and not at themselves. This not just keeps their morale up, but also makes them trust themselves back again to handle the situation better. When others give you constructive criticism, they are giving you their point of view for your improvement and not theirs. Criticism is often an indication that the other person got offended by something you said or did. It is possible that a little empathy can win them over to your point of view. How to deal with criticism at work. Critics criticize out of fear. So when someone criticizes, that's actually a clear indication that they've been threatened. Because the very nature of leadership means you're gonna go beyond the safe harbor of the known, you're gonna leave the status quo or what what is, and you're going to push into the blue ocean of possibility. So as you start to change, as you start to move things forward, as you start to come up with more innovation at work and you're more enthusiastic and you work more effectively, you work harder and smarter, you're going to threaten the people around you who don't like change. And most human beings don't like change. And rather than taking personal responsibility for changing, it's much easier for the people around you to criticize. So just remember that when someone criticizes rather than celebrates your, your, your high performance and your vision and your positive energy, instead they criticize you, it's because they're in an emotion called fear they've been threatened. And then finally, just remember the very nature of leadership, and you are a leader without a title, and this world of ours, not only in business but in society, needs more heroes and leaders. The very nature of leadership means you will be criticized because as you step into a higher vision, people will not understand you because you're seeing possibility. You're seeing something that people around you don't see. That's what being a visionary is all about. And what happens is it's the very nature of leadership to attract criticism. If you listen to your critics, you'll never do anything great in your life. Close your ears to the critics, focus on your vision, play with possibility, and keep moving forward. 
A workplace is usually stereotyped to be a part of devil's workshop rather than a fun place because of a lot of reasons. Mostly because people are not trained to give criticism at work and therefore end up being terribly harsh. This leads to ego clashes, gossiping, preferential treatments, and awkwardness at work. Workplaces that do not have a feedback culture are weak in performance improvement, accountability, and training among other usual flaws due to lack of healthy communication. Negative feedback, or I prefer the word constructive criticism, is essential and it happens every day in the workplace. It's essential because we need to give feedback to employees, whether you're the manager or the leader, or even between team members, because we work with people and we serve each other and we need to be able to let people know how they're doing in terms of what's expected from them. But it's not always done well. In fact, it's often done very poorly. And there's also a lack of positive feedback. So if you're giving a lot of negative feedback and you're not doing it well, and there's a lack of positive feedback, slowly the employee can become demotivated. In most settings, Criticism is conveyed as meaningless banter, roasting, blame game, excuses, or showcasing discomforts in many ways. Remember what Einstein said, there are only two infinities, the universe and human stupidity. So that means you are going to have to put up with some stupid crap from some very stupid people. But don't cause a ruckus, don't yell and shout that they're a douchebag or tell them to go shove anything up any unknown holes. Just smile and say, you know what, you're right. Thank you for your feedback. The truth is, criticism is actually good for you. It just doesn't feel all that great at the time. But you do get to see another side of someone. You get a little bit stronger and a little bit smarter. In most cases, your style at work may be disliked. Also, the critic would be engaging with you from a position of power and authority to correct you. You need to etch this into your mind that they're criticizing your work and it is not a character assassination to you as a person. The job of a critic is not to harm you. If you feel that they are attacking you, take a step back and step into their shoes. You need to ask yourself the following questions. Is your critic irrational due to physical or emotional stress? Unskilled in communicating? Lacking empathy and emotional intelligence? Acting on behalf of someone else? Making assumptions based on someone else's opinion about you? Feeling intimidated? because they perceive you as a threat. Sometimes we need to understand that some people are critical by nature, and hence, some behavior is extremely routine and normal to them. It's a sad reality that there will always be people who criticize just for the sake of criticizing. They come from negative backgrounds, negative families, negative experiences, and so they're always looking for something that is not correct. No matter how good your work is, these people will find flaws where flaws do not really exist and gleefully point them out. This type of criticism is not the same as constructive criticism, and it offers little value. If you're certain that a person's criticisms are unfounded, smile, thank them, and move on. Finally, handle criticism like an expert. You must try to understand the underlying messages of what the other person is saying. When somebody gives you constructive criticism, you should be quick to ask them how they think you can improve. Most of the time, if a person's critiques are valid, then they may already have an idea in mind for how you can address them. However, they may not share it with you unless you ask. So be sure to delve deeper into a person's criticism or negative opinion, asking them to clarify and for other suggestions. When they do clarify, uh, listen intently and take their suggestions to heart. They may not always be valuable to you, but many times they will be. Many people's lives have been changed over the years by one piece of feedback that set them in a different direction. The more objective you are at this point, the more you will be able to decipher what others are intending to say. However hard it is to accept, do not react at that moment. Evaluate the situation objectively like a third party. Proceed to use logic to consider what is said. Listen only to discover what you can agree with. If your points are legitimate, that's all the more reason to save them for a different and better time when they can be a focus of the conversation and not a defense strategy. Also, if something has gone wrong from your part, 
Have the humility and the courage to own up to your mistakes. Apologize for your part as it indicates to the critical party that you're capable of taking responsibility for your actions and not just evading it. It will also help shift the exchange out of combat mode and into collaboration. Here's the thing. When criticism is happening in the room and when you feel like it's being directed at you, you're not on a firing squad. It can be a dialogue, and you can think of it as a dialogue. Now, I know you're going to say, what? A dialogue? If somebody's criticizing me, it's not a dialogue. I have to defend myself. I have to be protected. Well, okay, I understand that. But if we can take a deep breath and say, I'm going to listen. I'm going to listen to this. I'm going to see if there's anything about it that might be helpful to me. I'm going to think like a learner, and I'm going to see if I can ask more questions therefore turning this thing into a dialogue. Or maybe ahead of time, I even ask questions about projects that I'm doing or things that are happening in my relationship so that I get to the place where I'm not waiting to defend myself. I'm opening dialogues about improvement, about change, about whatever it is that may come up that may feel injurious to me, that might make me feel insecure or self-doubting. I can think of it like an opportunity to learn, I can turn it into a dialogue, and I can make the climate in the room the way that I need it to be. If I can quiet my mind, listen, and understand that most of the time nobody's really out to get me. If criticism comes up, something's happening, and we can all participate in how to get that to work a little bit more smoothly, or have everybody on the same page, or have something work more harmoniously. How to give constructive criticism. Criticism, like rain, should be gentle enough to nourish a man's growth without destroying his roots. This was rightly said, by Frank A. Clark. Constructive criticism begins with the right intention, as you are using it to speak your truth in a way that it leads the other person towards betterment. What is the intention behind this criticism? Are they offering it as a means to make you better? Are they offering it as a suggestion in how you can adapt your work? Or are they just being negative? Are they trying to push you down because they do similar work and they want to be seen as better than you? That's a problem with them. That's not a problem with you. The easy way to know what the intention is is whether or not there's an actual action or suggestion attached. If they just say they don't like it, it's weird, etc., then they may just be trying to be negative. If they give you a suggestion for how you can improve, then it's safe to assume their intention is at least 51% well-meaning, 49% negative, right? And then depending on your history with this person, you may be able to know that it's more well-meaning. If for some strange reason you sense that their intention is positive is well-meaning, and yet they don't have a suggestion for improvement, then you can follow up by asking them, well, how would you do this, right? If they're working in the same line as you, or if they're a customer as you, what would you like to see? You can ask them follow-up questions. But if you sense that their intention is just to be negative on you, if their intention is just to criticize you to, to bring themselves up temporarily, then again, you can deflect it. Often in the corporate world, there's a tried and tested method of sandwiching one's negative between two positive aspects of a person. Here's what the compliment sandwich looks like when you don't want to choke. First of all, that first bun, it's a compliment, but it's got to be sincere. It's got to be something from your heart, something you really believe that's positive about this person. And you say it in such a way that it doesn't connect with the issue that you're going to address. So for example, if you're going to talk to them about a performance issue, then don't compliment their performance. That confuses the message. And then the third thing about that first bun is don't close it with any ands, ifs, or buts. Close it with a period. So it might sound something like this. Joe, we feel very fortunate to have you on the team here, period. Now you're ready to move on to the difficult issue. Here's how to do it in such a way that you don't choke on it. First of all, check your information. Make sure you don't get out there with information that is embarrassing to you. That's choking on your compliment sandwich.
So for example, I might say to Joe, Joe, I just want to check what I've seen. I've seen your car parked in the customer only area. Your staff, I'm wondering why you aren't parking back with the rest of us. And Joe says, oh, I sold my car to one of the customers. Whew. You just saved yourself from choking on that sandwich. Now, if Joe says, well, in fact, I have been parking in the customer spot, it's closer to the front of the building. Now you move to your expectations. You say to Joe, Joe, I'm really looking for you to be parking with the rest of us back in the staff lot. You think that's something you could do? The third part of it is to see if Joe has any questions about what you've just said. If he doesn't, you move on. You move to the second bun, and that's your second compliment. And here again, it's got to be sincere. Repeat the first compliment if you can't think of a second one. Make it sincere, close with no ands, if or buts. That's a compliment sandwich you won't choke on. One important tip when you are doing a feedback sandwich, and this is why some cynics call it the shit sandwich, is because the feedback needs to be really authentic. It's got to be genuine uh, and heartfelt from, from, from you, the person giving the feedback. So think of something that is really is true before you give a feedback sandwich. Constructive criticism has two phases. One is the evaluation stage, where you make an assessment about the other person's strengths and weaknesses. The second is the suggestion phase, where you make recommendations that will help the person to be better. There is a method that you can apply in giving constructive criticism. It is called feed-forward method, which is developed by Marshall Goldsmith. Feedback is typically focused on the past and mostly on what is not working. On the other hand, feed forward is focused on providing future-oriented options or solutions. Now, what are the rules of feed forward? Rule number one is no feedback about the past. No feedback about the past. We spend too much time in our lives talking about the past. Have you ever been impressed with your husband, wife, or partner's near photographic memory? of your previous sins, which have been documented and will be shared with you in a repetitive and annoying way. Well, you know what? We can't change the past anyway. Rule one, no feedback about the past. Rule two is harder. You can't judge or critique ideas. In Feed Forward, you're asked to ask for input and listen to it without judging or critiquing. A good philosophy is, when I get an idea, I should treat it like a gift. Treat the idea like a gift. Now, if somebody gives me a gift, should I say, stinky gift, bad gift, I don't like your stupid gift. What should we say when somebody gives us a gift? Thank you. Treat the input like a gift and you say thank you. Now, how does feed forward work? Well, you can do this with a team, a large group. I've done it from six to 6,000. Each person picks one area to improve. Not 30, not 50, not 100, one. And whatever they pick needs to come from their heart. Then each person says, my name is, I want to get better at. The other person gives them one or two very quick ideas for the future, no feedback about the past, they say thank you. The other person says, my name is, I want to get better at, one or two quick ideas for the future, no feedback about the past, thank you. They shake hands and rush off and talk to another person. The goal is to talk to as many people as you can when I do this in a large group, maybe in five or six minutes. In a book, The Feedback Fix by Joe Hirsch, there is a description of a concept used by Pixar Studios called plussing. When the Pixar team checks up on their daily work progress, they have a mutual feedback session. But this comes with a twist which contributes to its effectiveness, which is people cannot point out a problem without suggesting an alternative to it. Pixar does a, a regular session when they're making a film where they look at the film and they just shred it. They give nothing but constructive feedback. And they stole a method from improv, which is that saying yes and is better than saying no. So even when you have to give criticism, you have to add a plus, you have to add something positive. So if you have a piece of negative feedback to say to someone, you need to come to them in the spirit of plussing and, and say that you also, you have a responsibility to help them by giving them a suggestion for how to overcome it, right? So it has to be, here is your piece of negative feedback. 
what if we, maybe we could, have you tried, here's what works for me. Any of these are great transitional phrases into the suggestion that you're gonna use. Now, your goal is to give them that piece of feedback and then add a plus to tell them that I care so much about you and the project that I also want to help. But if they don't need your help, if they find a way to overcome it that is more true to them and how they work, that's not your problem. Your job was done when you added the plus. So two ways to give constructive feedback are really two things that need to be paired together. The first is to add a plus. Make sure you are also adding some suggestions, some tips, some way that they can improve on that thing that you just gave them feedback on. And then realize that they have the right to choose whether or not to apply it and don't hold a grudge if they choose not to. They can accept or reject your criticism. Instead of just praising a person for his or her talents, this technique focuses on helping them explore that talent and widen their horizon like would you like to lead the team with that idea? Instead of just, that's a great idea. So, it is a step forward from feedback, which the name quite literally suggests. This clearly has more impact on changing, not just an individual's personality, but the whole group dynamic by creating an ecosystem of healthy and creative sharing. Unlike feedback, one good thing about feed forward is that it can come from anyone who knows about the task. People will love your feed forward because it's filled with ideas for improvement that will cover almost all of the same material as constructive criticism. Picture this. As an employee, you just gave a bad presentation to your client. Your manager was present in the room. After clients leave the boardroom, your manager can either make you relive the humiliating experience or prepare you for the future presentations by giving you suggestions. The suggestions were made with clarity and it was given in a positive way. You just got constructive criticism. So when you're giving constructive criticism in the form of negative feedback, what you're doing is that you're pointing out what you'd like to see from the employee rather than what they're doing wrong. For example, would be if somebody's working on a PowerPoint presentation and you don't like the design, maybe you find it old fashioned and they're not using uh, the tool where now you have recommended designs and they're really easy to apply. So you could say, what I'd like to see is more vibrant colors. So think of what you want and tell that to the employee rather than saying, well, I don't like the colors. It looks like uh, old fashioned. Can you come up with something better? And that's not what we want to show to people today. So really starting with what you'd like to see, that way you could start a conversation and the blow for some people is less brutal. Constructive criticism works because it hits exactly where it is needed and that gives you a push to motivate yourself to do better and to be better next time. We talked about criticism in all the spheres, but we forgot the most prominent one, self-criticism, something that can make or break you. It can be the spark you need when no one else believes in you. Your introspection and reflection on your own actions and then correcting them day by day can bring an exponential amount of change that no one else and nothing else can. The very best thing that you can do is be your own toughest critic. If you're your own toughest critic, it's really hard for other people to criticize you. If you go, you know what, today I did influence boot camp. It was a great event for all these people, but I sat there and I looked at them like, I could have done 100% better. I screwed up 50 times. Yeah, they got 50 ideas, but, but I could have delivered them so much better. I could have told better stories. I could have told more interesting things. I don't like the way I talked over there. I don't like the way I communicated. I don't like the way that I leaned over there. I don't like the fact that I tripped over the tape over there. Things like that. Be your own toughest critic, because once people hear you saying how how, how you, how you uh, self-interpret what you just did, it's really hard for them to say anything other. Hey, Kev, lighten up, man. You did fine. Don't worry about it. Everything's okay. Okay? And that's really what would be a nice thing for most people to do. If you're tough on yourself, and I'm not kidding about this, the most successful people in the world are their own toughest critics. Sure, you have to believe you're great, but then you swim your race you run the, the marathon, you create the book, you create the art, you deliver the product, but then you go, you know what? I could do better. 
and I will. My next one is gonna be just awesome. It's gonna be way better even. This is an A+, plus, but I'm gonna make an A plus squared. I'm gonna just keep doing it better and better. And so when people criticize, say, you know what, I, I took that, eh, it was okay. Oh, you'll do great with that. But the next one, even better, okay? You be tough on yourself so other people don't have to. And that makes this all so much easier. Cool? As Socrates said, an unexamined life is not worth living. The motive behind criticism often determines its validity. Those who care, criticize where necessary. Those who envy, criticize the moment they think that they have found a weak spot. Chris is Jami. All kinds of criticism has its hidden gems. It's not about what is said that matters. What matters to you is how you felt about it. Even the worst of humiliations has its power to transform your life. Never let any moment of pain go wasted. Use it as a defining moment to rewrite your future. After all, criticism reveals ourselves and the people who criticize us. If you take criticism proactively, this could be the best personal and professional improvement tool that can nurture your life. It is a power tool that can build personalities or destroy them. Use it wisely while giving it and receiving it.